Oh, shit! You blood! Oh, no. I'm so sorry. I hope it wasn't my fault. You know, if it was anybody else, I'd say it was absent-mindedness. But knowing you, Father Brown, I'd say your mind was preoccupied with matters which might be of possible interest to me. Why, bless my soul, it's Inspector Boyne. I had no idea this was, this was your manner. Well, I was given this manner directly I left hospital. Remember when that fellow tried to blow me up? <laughs> Salvini, the human cannonball. Yes, I remember. Oh, dear. Well, after that, they thought I deserved a bit of peace and quiet. Well, that's the most regrettable expression, which bears no relation to true peace and quiet. Well, 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 Inspector. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I have a feeling it's about to happen again, fairly soon. What is it? Murder. What? Well, you don't believe all that talk about premonitions, do you? Mrs. Aylmer's an hysterical woman. You said so yourself. Now, there may be evil spirits in that house. I wouldn't know that's more your line, Father. But I never heard of anyone self getting themselves murdered by such no, creatures. No, 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 no. That's not quite what I meant, Inspector. You see, both the Aylmers are frightened, but for different reasons. Mrs. Aylmer's afraid of the supernatural, and that's why she sent for me. And she certainly is getting on her husband's nerves with all this talk of evil spirits and so forth. But that's really not what's worrying him. What is, then? He thinks that Strake is going to come back and kill him. <laughs> Did he tell you that? <laughs> no, 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 of course not. But I noticed that he had a revolver in his jacket pocket... So I don't think it can be hobgoblins he's frightened of, do you? Old Mr. Elmer has a quarrel with Strait. He makes arrangements to cut him out of his will and dies, apparently from natural causes, before he can see his lawyer. Mm -hmm. Three sons go to court and win their case, and then... Strake starts sending them threatening letters, and months later, Philip Aylmer is found dead, apparently by his own hand. And a little after that, Stephen meets with a horrible death in his own factory. Oh, by the way, you're, uh, you're a very good health, Father. And you're good health, too, Inspector. Now, in heaven's name, what does all that add up to? One natural death, one suicide, and one accident on the face of it. Ah, but you and I are not concerned with the face of things, oh, are we? Inspector, I know. You're hoping I'll say that Strake has laid a family curse on the Elmers. That's the trouble with being a priest. People expect you to believe anything. All right, what do you suggest? Pure coincidence? I think old Mr. Elmer more or less frightened himself to death. Philip may have committed suicide. Look, I examined the body half an hour after it was found. It was in the middle of the lawn. A wet lawn that would have left any mark. And there wasn't another footprint anywhere near the body. Now, if somebody else killed him, they'd have had a swoop down from the sky. All right, then. Philip committed suicide. And Stephen, according to the evidence at that inquest, was a rather stingy kind of fellow who would not spend money replacing worn-out machinery. So when the main belt snapped, yes, in a way, I suppose it was his fault, yes. In fact, you don't think Strake had anything to do with anything? Yes, of course he did, Inspector. It was Strake who got old Mr. Aylmer into such a state. And when he sent threatening letters to the sons, each of them reacted according to their different temperaments. Philip got frightened, and Stephen got careless. Yes, of course he was responsible for their deaths. And the police can't lay a hand on him. Oh. Well, that rather depends on what he tries to do to the third son, doesn't it? He's moved into the house, I gather. I haven't called yet. I understand he's having some domestic difficulties. What do you mean? Well, he's having difficulty in finding any domestics. <laughs> Nobody in the village wants to work in that house anymore. I think it's haunted. He's living there alone, I believe. Poor chap. I dare say he's as frightened as all his brothers were. Well, he doesn't have to live there. I mean, after all, he did get the house for nothing. Yes. You know, come to think of it, he's done rather well, has Mr. Arnold Aylmer. Yes, I suppose he has. Oh, oh goodness me. You don't think that... Well, his motive for getting rid of them is just as good as Strake's. And he's finished up with the whole caboodle, hasn't he? The house, the money, everything. Oh, dear, oh, dear, oh, dear. Well, now, have I your permission to go and talk to him? 
Well, now, now, I'm not so sure he'd be too pleased to have you poking around up there. Nobody ever notices me. It'd be different if half a dozen of your men went marching into the grounds. Mm. Uh, or perhaps on second thoughts, it might be just as well, just in case. Uh, Very well, Father. Goodbye, Inspector. No, no, better not. Uh, huh? I get so damp in all that shrubbery. Uh, I'll go. I'll go alone. Ooh, I believe it's going to snow. Do you not realize, Father Brad? Do you not believe, beyond all your other beliefs, that there is but one reality where all things merge into one? Hatred into love, man into the devil, the devil into God. No. No. How can you say no? You've seen part of that eternal drama with your own eyes. You've seen John Strait try to kill Arnold Elmer by black magic. You've seen Arnold Elmer kill John Strait by white magic, and yet you still don't believe it? No, I don't. May I ask, why he not? Because you're not Arnold Elmer. You're John Strait. And you've just killed the last of the brothers. And it's his body that's lying out there in the snow. It was the Apostle Spoon, you see. Uh, oh, uh, uh, the Apostle Spoon. Now, you wouldn't deliberately break a thing like that, would you, Inspector? So why should a man who spent his whole life collecting an antique silver? Well, but having gone to all that trouble, I mean, why didn't he load the pistol? Ah, oh, well, he couldn't find the powder or the ramrod or something or other, I suppose. The shot I heard must have come from his own revolver. The silver bullet, the idea, the silver bullet must have been an inspiration. Hmm. Tell me this, when you first saw him, did you really believe that it was Arnold Amon? Oh, my goodness, yes. Well, <clears throat> it was a dressing gown, you see. I mean... I mean a dressing gown is one of the really good disguises I've ever come across. I mean, when you see a man in a dressing gown in a house, you naturally assume that he's in his own home, don't you? Well, when he came through that stained glass door, I thought he'd come from the bedroom. And then I remembered that that was the makeshift sick room that they'd made up for poor old Mr. Aylmer. Of course, it was stupid of me not to have thought of that. You see, he hadn't been in that room at all. He'd come straight in from the garden. And when I realized that, I knew exactly what had happened. Then there dawned on this strange and fertile mind the idea of exchanging roles with his dead enemy. He'd already assumed the part of Arnold Elmer. So why shouldn't Arnold Elmer's corpse be passed off as John Strake's? The idea must have appealed to the man's odd, twisted imagination. <laughs> it was like some horrible fancy dress ball with the two mortal enemies going there dressed in each other's clothes. Fancy dress ball? Sounds more to me like a dance of death. Yes. With one of the partners already dead. Tell me, you know, the body in the snow, oh, Anna, yeah. remember I said that the, the stained glass door suddenly blazed with a red light. It was like a huge blood stain spreading across the carpet. And I couldn't think what it was at first. And then I realized, of course, it was the, the light reflect, reflected from the snow outside. Now, that must have been the moment when Strake opened the garden doors to throw the corpse out onto the terrace. Having, of course, dressed him in his own long black cloak. Yes, yes, yes. And you know, it really did look like a great black bird lying there. The cloak was too long, of course, and he used that fact to weave his extraordinary story about a ghostly creature that flew through the air. He used everything, don't you see? The man was an artist using every circumstance that came along. Instead of creating, he preferred to destroy. Yes, yes. What a great novelist the man would have made. <laughs> you know, Inspector, I shall never be able to look at a coat stand again without a shudder. <laughs>